Neighborhoods, communities, and sometimes entire regions go through cycles. It can impact every social and economic strata, and it's a scenario currently on full display in a pretty large swath of the city of Atlanta. English Avenue, Vine City, Ashview Heights, and the Atlanta University, four historic neighborhoods that make up part of Atlanta's west side. During the late 1800s and on into the 20th century, the area was a haven for white working class families. In the 1940s, demographic changes would give way to African American families and business owners. When the 1960s rolled around, Atlanta luminaries like Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and his wife Coretta Scott King, State Senator Julian Bond, and the city's first African American mayor, Maynard Jackson, all called the west side home. Then, time and transformation. In the 1970s, people traded in-town living for the spacious amenity-filled suburbs. The west side would lose its luster. Some residents remained, but communities eventually spiraled into a cycle of poverty, crime, and a bit of bureaucratic corruption. In recent years, a change. Businesses and services are returning to the city's core, bringing a new beginning for current residents and new arrivals. Atlanta's west side is experiencing change on a scale some might say only happens once in a generation. The impact is likely to be nothing short of transformative. And Westside Future Fund Executive Director John Amon is in charge of making sure the benefits aren't just reserved for a select few. You're an Atlanta native. Grady Baby. Grady Baby. I was born in the 60s yeah. and, you know, was a teenager in the, in the 80s and then later in the 90s, so it was a time there was a lot of um, conversation about would Atlanta be able to, um, you know, continue to grow as a city. The region at the time was exploding, but, right. but the city itself. So when you went off to college, was civic engagement always a goal, or did you have another career in mind? Going off to college is an overstatement because I went down the street to Emory. Okay. Um, I grew up in Drew Hills. That's true. You know, coming out of Emory, I really, when, when I, I was really interested in politics, public policy, did political science, I didn't really know what I was going to do. Right. And then kind of a mentor of mine said, hey, why don't you go to Washington? I think you'd enjoy working on Capitol Hill. Right. And so that literally me and a buddy picked, packed up his Monte Carlo. We had no job. We drove up to Washington. You know, we had aspirations of getting great jobs on Capitol Hill. We quickly, you know, hit the shoals of reality. It had to be waiters and other things till we could really, you know, break in. And was blessed in my early career to uh, work for a congressman who represented um, DeKalb County and other counties. And from that have just had who a consistent... Was it was... Um, well, no one's going to know his name, so I'll say the name everyone will know, which is Cooter from Dukes of Hazard. <laughs> um, but his uh, his name was Ben Jones. Right. Were you doing constituent relations for him? Well, I ended up being his legislative director. Uh -huh. Key learning, unless you're at the stratosphere, your ability to influence health care, national debt, et cetera, n non-existent. And so the stuff we could really do something about was local issues. You could get make something happen at the local level, and the thing I love working on the local level, you could actually see a beginning and an end. Right. Because they're still talking about the same set of issues in Washington they were talking about when I was there however many years ago. After you got out of the political game, what was your next step? Was it economic development at that point? Yeah, well, I went to business school, management yep. school. I went to, uh, you know, Yale School of Organization and Management. They sure. got a great program that really has a kind of a public-private um, focus, which was attractive to me. And then I got out of... Uh, Graduates who wanted to come back to Atlanta made a decision to come back to the city and then ended up, uh, it was a great opportunity, working for the Atlanta Committee for the Olympic Games. Right. And that was a great job because it really showed me the power of big vision, right, win the 1996 Olympics. And a, another key lesson I always remember, deadline, right? Because if, if we got to decide when to get ready for the Olympics, we'd never have been ready. We'd still be having meetings. <laughs> you spent a big chunk of your career with the Atlanta Committee for Progress. What's it like to have to m sort of direct a group of leaders who are all, you know, again, at, at the pinnacles of their career? One thing about being executive director, it's incredibly humbling because you say, these people are these leaders for a reason. Incredibly talented, smart, committed men and women. You know, the incredible power where you can get, you know, a mayor representing a city, partnering with the business community, once they can align, and each do the things they can uniquely do. Um, you know, the mayor is a, is a strong political leader leading the city, the business bringing their expertise and other, you can just get a tremendous amount done. I view that what you did at the, at the ACP as being very good preparation for West Side Future Fund because you're basically trying to transform an entire neighborhood mm -hmm. through, with the support of the corporate community. T 
Tell me about the West Side Future Fund and where we're at right now. And give me a, a quick snapshot of, of how things are going with, with, with the whole program so far. At the core, the West Side Future Fund is about creating an ecosystem to disrupt the cycle of poverty in four historic neighborhoods. Um, it was the original vision of uh, Mayor Kasim Reed as part of, you know, when he really committed it with um, Falcons owner Arthur Blank to focus on the West Side neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. You know, the mayor recognized you need a long-term organization to drive change. Um, but we're making great progress because we've got uh, four impact strategies we're focused on. You know, public safety, cradle to career education, health and wellness, and mixed income communities. And we have impact partners we're working with. So things that are already happening um, and have happened you know, the Atlanta Police Foundation has opened up a new youth center in English Avenue that's focused on intervention, so f youth get out of the juvenile justice system. There's going to be a great new park in the heart of Vine City. So if folks are familiar with Old Fourth Ward Park, this is going to be a, you know, even a bigger version of that. It's going to be a beautiful park, a beautiful asset right in the heart of Vine City. So we, obviously you have large corporate benefactors who are very involved in the fund. Um, how can the typical Atlanta, smaller Atlanta business or uh, individual find a way to connect to the fund itself. Well, this is about people and helping people who have been trapped in cycles of poverty get out of poverty. So it's mm -hmm. at a core people to people. So we want people to get involved. Um, so one way they can get involved is to visit our website, westsidefuturefund.org, and learn more about what we're doing, see an area of interest to them. Another great way to come in um, is with the West Side Volunteer Corps. As you're participating in lifting up you know, these historic neighborhoods, so we'd love for folks to get involved. Do you have any examples of, 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 of early successes that, you, you know, stars who've really helped the fund uh, kind of get its legs? Absolutely. You know, the residents of these communities, especially the homeowners, want to stay in the communities. Right. You know, many of them are making um, kind of middle-aged uh, jobs, and so, you, you know, Mayor Reed announced earlier this year the Anti-Displacement Tax Fund. And that's where we announced that future tax appreciation for residents of this year, the West Side Future Fund, would pay tax appreciation. We announced it in front of the home of Renee Sanders. Um, she's a nurse at the Veterans Hospital. Um, she actually is in the home that was built by Habitat for Humanity. She's about to pay off her Habitat mortgage. Hmm. She wants to stay in English Avenue, stay in the community, but she's concerned if revitalization is successful, appraisals will go up, right. taxes then will go up, but this takes that fear off the table. So that's a real success because she wants to stay in the neighborhood. And the momentum continues. Earlier this year, Westside Future Fund recently gave the public a look at its first property acquisition. A 35-unit apartment complex will eventually be revamped into affordable housing. The renovation is said to cost $2 million and should be open to occupants this fall.